down to my wedding rings or I'm going to lose it. <laughs> have you ever, have you, you ever worked in an office building where, like at the library, it's an automatic sink where you just hold your hands there? Do you ever have a long day at work and you get home and you're like this? Yes. <laughs> you realize you're at home, you're like, oh yeah, I don't have that technology at home yet. <laughs> No, you can't get it for your home. I just don't have it yet. Um, I have three kids that the funds go to mostly. Uh, but thank you. Hopefully you enjoy the break. And before we get started with the last part of our contest, I would like to bring up Barbara for another special announcement. Barbara Beckham. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, real quickly. We have another event coming up in October before our fall conference. It's called The Call. The Call. The Call means communication and leadership lessons. Okay. And our first one's going to be October 22nd. It's going to be at the Morton Grove Library in Niles. And I'm, I'm sorry, in Morton Grove. Morton Grove Library. That makes sense, right? <laughs> We're going to have two dynamic speakers of leadership. Joan Moore will be there. She is dynamic. A lot of people heard her and speak, and she is wonderful with presentations, leadership skills. She's going to be there to teach us and give us even more skills. Then we have Stan. We all know Stan. <laughs> <laughs> yes. He's going to be there also teaching us some more dynamic leadership skills. And then guess what? We're going to have some fun. We're going to have a little talent show going on that, that night. So I want everybody just to put another thing, iPad, phone, and a text. October 22nd, Warren Grove Library. We will have flyers coming out sometime this week, so to remind you. But I think my minute's up. Right. Thank you very much. So being so close to Halloween, is there going to be like costumes? People coming in costumes now? Probably so. <laughs> At your own risk. Okay. I might, be, I might be the only one. <laughs> All right. <Go> for it. <laughs> All right. So I would now like to announce the order of our contestants for the humorous speech contest. And is there a Greg Lubicka in the audience? I don't see one. No. Okay. So the contestant order for the humorous speech contest is going to be as follows. First contestant, Roger Nelson. Roger Nelson. Second contestant. Is going to be John McIntyre. John McIntyre. And the third contestant is going to be Jill Morgenthaler. Jill Morgenthaler. And I would like to enter. Oh, yeah, that's right. The timing announcement. Right? Thumbs. Oh yeah, just to remind you again, please turn the phones off or on vibrate uh, or any other technology devices that might make noises. And are our timers ready? Timers are ready again for the humor speech contest. You will see the green card at five minutes. You will see the yellow card at six minutes. And you will see the red card at seven minutes. And after the red card, you have 30 minutes to wrap up your speech. 30 seconds. 30 seconds. <laughs> 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 30 seconds. <laughs> Thank you for the audience elbow. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce our first contestant for the <coughs> speech contest, and that is Roger Nelson. Please welcome Roger Nelson. And your title? Oh, you need to uh, the title is Sun Sheet. I know, I love my sheets. Oh, uh, <laughs> go grab them. Ask, it's ask any robot, the future is going to be awesome. Ask any robot, the future is going to be awesome. Roger Nelson. Mom, Dad, and the kids standing on the driveway. Watch 
watching as the car disappears into the distance. Rest assured, though, your luggage will arrive at your vacation spot <laughs> in perfect safety and on schedule. <laughs> Mr. Toastmaster, fellow Toastmasters, and welcome guests. The age of robotics is coming, and it will change our lives in ways we can scarcely imagine. Allow me to describe to you this awesome future that awaits us. Not only will our cars be robotic, our family pets will be robotic. Robotic cats and dogs will let themselves out of the house and back in without bothering you. Robotic cats will dispose of the mice they kill by themselves rather than presenting them to you as gifts. <laughs> robotic dogs will chase frisbees, mailmen, and cars going down the street with no people inside. <laughs> yes, the future is going to be awesome. Another great innovation is going to be the robotic vacuum cleaner. Now, I'm not talking about the simplistic models we have now that just wander randomly around the floor. <coughs> the robotic vacuum cleaners of the future are going to be highly sophisticated devices. They will lift furniture to vacuum underneath. They will lift your legs to vacuum underneath. Preferably while you're sitting down. <laughs> and of course, they will perform that one traditional task. The one thing vacuum cleaners have done throughout history. They will chase the robotic cats and dogs. <laughs> they will chase them all over the house. They will chase them out the door into the yard. They will chase them over lawns, over driveways, over sidewalks. It will be utter chaos. <laughs> On the plus side, our lawns, driveways, and sidewalks will be cleaner than they've ever been before. <laughs> so yes, the future is going to be awesome. Your refrigerator will also be robotic. In fact, your robotic refrigerator will even go to the store and buy your food for you. And it will make sure that you're eating a very healthy diet. For example, if you tell your refrigerator you want beer or pop, it will buy mineral water. <laughs> if you ask for corn chips, it will buy broccoli. <sighs> Yes, you're going to be miserable. <laughs> but think how much healthier you'll be. Now, of course, if you really want to eat junk food, you can still go to the store yourself. Just don't let the fridge see you. <laughs> For if it sees you outside eating anything unhealthy, it will storm out of the house and try to grab that junk food out of your hands. Yes, with the refrigerator in hot pursuit. <laughs> you will be guzzling beer pot. You'll be stuffing corn chips in your face. <laughs> Running over lawns, over driveways, <laughs> over sidewalks, hurtling over robotic dogs and robotic cats, and vacuum cleaners. <laughs> the future is going to be awesome. The real ultimate, though, of future robotics will be <coughs> we have robotic children. That's right, robotic children. Think about it. Imagine the possibilities. As babies, there'd be no more crying in the night, throwing food or spinning up. Their hoop would come in vibrant colors and fragrant scents like pine and <laughs> As they grow older, they would be perfect little angels. They would listen to all your words of wisdom. They would greet you at the door with loving arms. They will fold their own laundry and put it neatly away. Yes, it will be parental paradise. Well, at least until Andy knows coming. 
Some computer geek with too much time on his hands decides it would be fun to hack the system and modify the software. <laughs> on that day, you will come home to find that your robotic children have locked you out of your own house. But don't worry, there is still a way for you to get in. Simply go down to the supermarket, buy yourself a can of pop, <laughs> a bag of corn chips, <laughs> return home, stand outside the kitchen window in plain view of the refrigerator. <laughs> The refrigerator will open the door to come out and grab that out of your hands, and that is your opportunity to bolt into the house and achieve victory! Yes, the future is awesome! <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, I have told you about the wondrous future that awaits us. Self-driving automobiles, robotic cats and dogs, aggressive robotic vacuum cleaners, berserk! Health-obsessed robotic refrigerators, <laughs> hacked robotic children. You've been warned. You've been warned. The apocalypse is coming. <laughs> <laughs> but honestly, aside from that little apocalypse thing, the future is going to be awesome. <laughs> Mr. Toastmaster. <laughs> It's going to be John McIntyre, speech entitled Nature Calling. Nature Calling, John McIntyre. Thank you, Mr. Toastmaster, fellow Toastmasters, and honored guests. Well, there I was, just minding my own business, standing in line at the bank when nature called. Nature wasn't just calling, she was screaming her lungs out. In other words, I had to go. And I was waiting in line, slowly inching forward, slowly inching forward, those seconds stretching out to minutes, which were stretching out to something like eternity. I was next in line to get to one of the tellers, and I heard one of the people up at the teller station saying, but I can't be overdrawn. I still have five checks left. Look. <laughs> Thinking, ah, you know the type. The type that read the obituaries and keep wondering why people keep dying in alphabetical order. <laughs> <laughs> well, I finally get to the front of the line and I see a very young teller. He looked like he was in high school. I looked at his name tag and I think it said his name was Bill, or maybe it was Ted. But it may as well have been Bill and Ted, because when I asked him, where's the restroom, he went, whoa, dude, that's like a totally excellent question, but like, our bathrooms are only for employees. I thought, well, nature's still calling, and I'm not having an excellent adventure. So I demanded to talk to the head teller. Big mistake. She was big and mean and scowling and had those evil horn-rimmed glasses and she came stomping out. You can almost hear the Darth Vader theme song following her. <laughs> bum, 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 bum. And I pl 
pleaded with her, going, uh, ma'am, I, I really have to go. I, you know, is there any way I can use the restroom? But she just gave me that evil grin, looked over her horn rimmed glasses, said, can't you read the sign on the wall? It says, bathrooms for employees only. Well, I had to go. I almost took out an employment application right there. <laughs> But the idea and the thought of working for Darth Vader's evil sister was just too much for me to handle. Very fortunately, right at that time, the bank president came walking by. And he was one of those bear super fans. He came walking by, hey, how you doing? What's going on? Hey, how about them bears, huh? I looked at him, yeah, how about them bears? He said, well, what's going on? I said, look, I really have to go. And nobody seems to want to let me use the restroom. He goes, well, you gotta go number one or number two. <laughs> I said, number two and number one, but one and two, what was that equal? Three, I gotta go three. Just, look, if I can't use the restroom, I'm gonna leave a deposit. You're not gonna wanna put your vault. <laughs> and he thought about it and goes, hey, well, anything for a customer. So yeah, go ahead and use the restroom. And Miss Vader, again, quit grinning, looked over her horn room glasses and waddled back to whatever cubicle she worked in. By then, I really, really had to go, and I tried to be as composed as possible, but the best I could do was sort of act like the monster on those old Frankenstein films as I started heading to the restroom. <laughs> well, I finally got into the restroom. I thought, wow, that was an ordeal. So I ran up to stall number one and opened it and looked inside, and it had one of those high school Petri dish biology experiment things going on. And I looked at it and thinking, this is gross. It's throbbing, it has a pulse, it's even moving. And on the lid, there's this weird blue dark stuff. I don't want any part of that. I went to stall number two, it was occupied. Finally, I got to stall number three, opened it, everything was great, except there was no toilet. Well, the sink over there was looking awfully inviting. And finally, I heard the second stall flush, Somebody ran out, and I ran in. I finally sat down thinking, wow, okay, now I can finally do my business and get on with my day. I heard somebody come in the restroom, and I think it was Bill and Ted, because he went into the first stall and said, whoa, what a mess, that's totally heinous. It looks like my grandmother's goulash. He went to the third stall finally, and he went in. Of course, that was the stall with no paper. And I'm sitting there, okay, just minding my own business. And I heard a knock. He said, oh, whoa, dude, you have like any extra toilet paper in your stall. I said, no. About a minute later, I heard another knock. Whoa, do you have any like newspaper or any scraps of paper at all I can use? I said, no. And about a minute later, I heard, whoa, dude, you have like five ones for a five? <laughs> I said, no, but I've got five ones for a 20. Oh, you're trying to rip me off, man. That's a totally heinous thing to ask. I said, have you looked at your bank rates lately? Well, about 15 minutes later, I was 15 pounds lighter and 15 pounds richer, thanks to Bill and Ted. Again, still minding my own business, just about to finish up the paperwork. I heard somebody come in, and they went in one of the stalls, and I heard them say, Hey, how you doing? I said, okay. And he said, uh, so what you doing now? I said, well, it's kind of obvious, isn't it? He said, well, are you doing anything for dinner tonight? I said, that's none of your business. Finally, he asked, guess what color I'm wearing? I said, look, I don't know what your problem is, but I don't go out with people. I just meet in restrooms, so whatever your game is, just leave me alone. And I heard him say, honey, I'm going to have to call you back. Every time I say something, this rude guy in the stall makes me <laughs> Well, in conclusion, just if there's any bank managers out there, just remember these little bits of words of wisdom. Nobody's going to think you're number one if you will not let them go number two. Mr. Closemaster. <laughs>
Okay, I'd like to introduce our last contestant for today, and that is Jill Morgenthaler, The Rub, A True Story. The Rub, A True Story, Jill Morgenthaler. Wayback Machine to 1977. I had just become a military intelligence officer. And the gentleman in charge of the program sat me down. He said, Do you understand, Lieutenant? Since we've cleared you, it also means the Army has the right to say yes or no to whom you marry. What? <laughs> Don't get your skivvies in a bunch. Skivvies, by the way, is Army Tough for Underwear. <laughs> Don't get your skivvies in a bunch. You can still have one night stands. What? <laughs> have you cleared that with my dad? <laughs> so I got my clearance with the conditions, and I headed off to South Korea. I was stationed along the DMZ, the demilitarized zone. That's kind of the no man land between North Korea and South Korea. We have eyes on them. They have eyes on us. It was really boring. <laughs> the only action taking place was in the village. When the military men would go into the village, they would get massages. They would come back with these big smiles because they got the wink, wink, nudge, nudge special. <laughs> so my girlfriend Kay, um, older than me, more experienced than me, she actually had already been married and divorced before she came to the army. One day she said to me, Jill, let's go in the village and get us one of those massages. I went, whoa, okay, I'm not losing my clearance over a wink, wink, nudge, nudge, uh-uh. She said, no, Jill, no, wink, wink, nudge, nudge, just a massage. The Army doesn't care about massages, they just care about matrimony. I said, yeah, but I was taught by my parents that matrimony comes before massage. <laughs> oh, Jill, get over it. So I got over it. We went to the village, went to the massage parlor. <coughs> the young women were pretty shocked to see us. This young lady took me to the room. She laughed, and I took off my skivvies, laid on the table, sheet on my back, and she came in. She started massaging me. Hey up! Hey up! Hey up! Really? Men pay for this? <laughs> At one point, the daughter of Bruce Lee left the room. And I thought, well, maybe I'm supposed to turn over. So I took the sheet, and as I started to turn over, she walks in right when I expose myself, and she screamed, ah! And I look down, it's all there, in the right place. And after that, I told Kay, never again. Of course, we all know, never say never. After Korea, I went to Germany. Kay came to visit me. I was so excited to see her because I was in love. I met Danny and I was in love. And I was hoping any day now he was going to propose to me. And Kay said, Jill, i got to give you a pre-engagement gift. Let's go downtown and get a massage. <laughs> <laughs> Kay, I swore off massages. Ah, Jill, the young lady didn't know what to do with a woman's body. I mean, just like my ex. <laughs> Get over it. So I got over it. We went to the salon. Out steps the most beautiful man. Tall, bronze, gorgeous. Muscles upon muscles. He made Fabio look like John Candy. <laughs> <laughs> and then he said the most wonderful thing I've ever heard. You? Oh my god, I had no idea Jill could sound so sexy. <laughs> Jill? I go, <clears throat> that, yeah. Jill? I am Mohammed. Oh, Mohammed, come to my mountains. <laughs> so I went in and I had a, a wonderful massage. Shortly after Kay left, my boyfriend sat me down. I thought, oh, he's going to propose. I'm going to say yes. The Army's going to say yes. Because you see, one reason why the army held on to saying yes or no is they wanted to make sure we didn't marry any Chinese spies or Syrian terrorists. Well, Danny was neither a Chinese spy nor a Syrian terrorist, so I'll say yes, the army will say yes, and then maybe, maybe we'll go to Sweden and get his and her massages. <laughs> and Danny says to me, 
this isn't working, I've met someone else, we're breaking up. Who did you meet? My masseuse. <laughs> I have a feeling he got the wink wink milk nudge special. And I was hurting. Then I thought, Jill, get over it. And I decided to get over it by getting a massage from Mohammed. So I put on my tight black skirt, my red lipstick. I don't know what I look like, but as soon as I walked into that salon, they went, we're not hiring. <laughs> I'm like, no, 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 I'm just here for Mohammed for a massage. And he came out and he's like, Jill, you're back. Ooh, you remember. So I went in, I had a wonderful massage on my back. He had me turn over. He didn't scream. <laughs> and they started massaging my ankles. And he's like, Gilles, what's happening? I said, well, I'm leaving Germany to go to grad school soon. And they start to massage up my calves. He goes, where? California. And then he started to massage around my knees. Sun and surf, California? Yeah, that California. And then he took, started to massage up my thighs. He's like, lovely Gilles, how would you like a massage every day? What? And as he started to massage up near my um, DMZ, he said, you marry me, take me to California. And as I looked at this beautiful man, I thought, wow, this beautiful man massages every day for the rest of my life. Oh, baby! And then somewhere back in my reptile brain, it went, warning, warning, top secret, top secret. And I looked at him and I went, Muhammad, where are you from? Syria. Oh, oh yeah, Siri Syria! <laughs> so I did the hardest thing I've ever done in my life. I said, no. The sacrifices I have made for our nation. <laughs> <laughs>
what Toastmasters club or clubs you represent? How long have you been at Toastmasters? What's the highest education award you've achieved? I joined Toastmasters in February of 2009, Axio Masters in Downers Grove, and then joined Peace, and I can't remember when I joined Peace, but uh, right when they started, I think, right when you started. So I joined Peace then, and I finished my TTM last fall. And your favorite quote I have is, keep your eye on your why. Why did you join Toastmasters? It's something that struck me when I was club president, area governor, old term, and division governor, that what we really needed were members to stay engaged, even if you finished your CC, and it just came to me. If you're connected to your why, why am I here, why did I join, you're going to stay connected for a long, long time. So I put it on the tagline. Okay, I like it. Thank you for convening today. Thank you, Matthew. Here's a certificate of Thank you. Thank you. Rishi, right? Yes, Rishi. So Rishi, tell us uh, what club or clubs are you in? How long have you been in Toastmasters? And what's the highest education award you've achieved? Sure, Matthew. I am part of uh, Platinum Toastmasters 4117. <coughs> it's located in Lyle. I've been to Toastmasters since 2006 or 2007. And my current distinctions I have is Conflict Communicator and Great. And your favorite quote you have, the road to success is always under construction. I like that. <laughs> yeah. Is that by? Is that yours? Or? No, I won't take credit for that. I, that's very creative in itself, but I just know it's an anonymous quote as, at the moment. Unless somebody knows, please share. I mean, I would like to know who it is, too. For me, it's very relevant. I'm in the construction management industry, so I mean, I deal with all that. But, you know, going through life, I've had my pitfalls and places where, you know, I've succeeded. But you know, overall, in the course of things, you might have you know cones or you know things that you have to stop, and it makes you think that you can go on and keep growing, and that's how you succeed. Is just continue on living on that road. All right, I like it. Thanks for being here. Isha, I know you. I know what club you're in, but for the audience, you can tell us. Uh, how long, what club or clubs you represent, how long you've been in Toastmasters, and what's your highest education award achieved? I am here representing people into public speaking Ooh. out of Oak Brook, which has great representation here today, so including our Toastmasters. So we have great job. Uh, and I've been in Toastmasters for four years, and I have CC. And let's see what we've got for you. You've heard this one before. Your favorite quote, whether you think you can or you can't, you're right. Sorry, I don't have the attribution because, like Rishi, I forgot mine. <laughs> so, Henry Ford, thank you. <laughs> so, yes, I don't always ascribe to the idea of the power of positive thinking. I sometimes think it's a little new and weird, but I must say that I've seen people in my life, both personally and professionally, who are very positive thinkers and they have moved mountains. And so I have to believe that it does have some effect, and so I try to remind myself of that every now and again by saying that I need to think positive thoughts because that's what I would call in the name. So. All right, well, thank you for competing. Here's the Larry, uh, what club or clubs do you represent? How long have you been in Toastmasters and your highest uh, education award achievement? I'm in uh, Oak Brook Speakers, and I have a CC and a CL, and I've been in Toastmasters for about three years. Three years, okay. And I think you're currently president of the Currently club? president of the public oh, speakers. All right, that's great. And let's see, for your favorite, okay, what inspires you most is people. How'd people. You, how'd you come up with that? Because that's what inspires me. I see people that do good things. I see people who, who need to do better things than they are, and it just kind of gets me going. When uh, one of the things I do is I teach LinkedIn to people that are unemployed, and when you're in the room and you're seeing the lights come on as people are learning and catching the theories and themes you're throwing out there, it, it pumps you up. It makes you feel good. So people inspire me. Definitely. Well, thanks for competing. Here's a certificate. And I know what you're saying when you see the lights come on. I'm still waiting for that day for my kids. <laughs> so like, I'm, they can't stay a little longer. Yeah. <laughs> Christine, you are a member of Hinsdale. Yes, I am. How long have you been a member? I've been a member for about seven years, and I have my CC. Okay, CC. All right. And let's see, 
What inspires you most is great food. Tell me about some great food. Then. <laughs> I love food. I mean, I fantasize about food. My ultimate fantasy is not to win a million dollars or even a billion, but to be at the bottom of a bat of chocolate ice cream <laughs> and have to eat my way out. <laughs>
Good afternoon, Toastmasters. This has been a very, very long day for me. <laughs> so thank you for each and every one of you for really stepping up at the last minute uh, with any Toastmasters meeting. We always have new faces coming over and taking up new roles, and I really, really appreciate the part of my heart for this. Uh, before we, we bring in the, uh, the winners for the speaking contest, so I would like to have the trio. We have two out of the three here to come up on stage and help me Can we have a drum roll? So we're going to go with the evaluation contest. Third place goes to Helen McCollum.